From the banks of the Colorado River in Lake Mead to the homes and businesses in Southern Nevada, welcome to Water Smarts, the podcast pumping from the heart of Las Vegas, where we engage with the experts who keep the water flowing throughout Southern Nevada. I'm Bronson Mack. And I'm Crystal Zelke. From how we treat it, deliver it, use it, protect it, and conserve it, the Water Smarts podcast is all about water in Southern Nevada. We hope to make you a little smarter about the one thing that keeps us all connected, water. Hey, Crystal, how are you today? I'm doing okay, Bronson. I could be better. Winter. Uh, Well, you know, it's like, it's been the year, or I should say the winter of sickness for me. So I'm battling another cold. I feel Uh, like this is my third time in the last several months. And I don't know if it's just like being back out there and doing all the things again or what it is, but super, super frustrating because I'm sick of being sick. I can't find cold medicine for the life of me. There's like nothing on the shelves wherever you go. There's a shortage of cold medicine. Frustrating. You're telling me there's a run on cold medicine. I can't find any. Wow, that is frustrating. You're not feeling well. You can't find the medicine that you need. I mean, think about this for a moment, if I can just make this analogy. We're about to talk a little bit about water conservation, right? Boy, you would really be pleased if uh, some folks who have been hoarding that cold medicine were actually conserving that cold medicine, making more available so that you had some when you needed it, right? Yeah, you know, leave some for the rest of us. (laughs) That's right. Good thing. Good thing we have good water management here, though, because there is water. We make sure everybody has the water when they turn on their tap. Nobody's going to turn on their tap and not have it because everybody else is using it. (laughs) You make a great point. And we are going to talk a little bit about some of the new conservation measures that are being implemented here in Southern Nevada to help ensure that, unlike cold medicine, that we continue to have the water supply that is necessary to meet the water needs of our community. And here today to join us, we've got Doug Bennett, SNWA Conservation Manager manager and J.C. Davis, our former enterprise conservation manager and the new director of customer care and field services for the Las Vegas Valley Water District. Doug and J.C., welcome to the Water Smarts podcast. Hey, thanks, Bronson. We're happy to be here. Happy to be back. Well, we are thrilled to have you back. You are two of our leading subject matter experts on everything conservation and even then some. So for our listeners, JC has worked extensively with the business and multifamily community and multifamily communities are apartment complexes or condos on implementing new conservation measures that affect them. He has transitioned into leading the Las Vegas Valley Water District's customer service department now, but he was very much part of the rollout of these new conservation measures. So we wanted to have him on and get his input. And then Doug and his team focus their time on the single family residential community. So really advancing water conservation amongst homeowners also working with HOAs, replacing grass, water efficient technologies, just a lot of different programs here that Doug's team has been involved in over the years. And well, unfortunately, this will probably be Doug's last appearance with us here on the Water Smarts podcast after 23 years of being the conservation manager for the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Doug is retiring and Doug has been instrumental in building this world class conservation program that we have here in Southern Nevada. And before jumping into conservation today, Doug, on behalf of the entire community, I know I want to thank you. I know that Crystal wants to thank you for all of the dedication that you have put forth in order to create the conservation programs that have made our community a world-class leader in water efficiency. Other municipalities look to SNWA to see what we have been doing to save and conserve water because our programs have been successful. And the vast majority of those programs, Doug, those were all incubated by you really implemented by you and your team. And so my hat's off to you for your decades of service to this community and helping make sure that Southern Nevada is indeed water smart, my man. Hey, thanks, Bronson. But it's not really all my doing in any respect. So this is an extraordinary organization. And I think when the drought woke us up in 2002 and said that we needed to do a whole lot more than we were doing at that point, this organization responded heartily all the way from the elected officials that we report to through the organization into the community. All the achievements that we've had have been collective achievements of everyone that resides in Southern Nevada. Now, I don't know if you guys know this. You all know that I moved here in about 2000 from Albuquerque, and I worked in water conservation at the city of Albuquerque. But I'll bet you don't know that I lived in southern Nevada in 1966. 
<laughs> no idea. Doug, I've been working with you all of these years, and I had no idea you were in Southern Nevada before you came here from Albuquerque. That's a, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, my dad was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and he came to Nellis. My whole family came to Nellis for fighter pilot training. So I was here when I was four years old, and I remember playing in one of the washes in North Las Vegas near the apartment complex where my family was living. So that said, it gives you a little insight to this story. So in 2000, I'm working at the city of Albuquerque and I tell my family, hey, listen, I got this job in Southern Nevada. I'm going to be moving to Las Vegas. My mom gets this panic look in her eyes and she says, oh, whatever you do, be careful around Hoover Dam. And I go, what? And she goes, when you were little, I had a dream that you fell over the dam and you were sucked through the intakes and we never saw you again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here I am, 37 years old, getting ready to go, right? And for you kids out there, 2000 was when you still drove across the dam, right? So I'm, I've got a truck and I'm pulling a little U-Haul trailer and I'm coming to Southern Nevada and damn straight I'm stopping at Hoover Dam, right? So I stop at the Overlook and I look and the lake is just so full. I'm, I've got that view of the penstock that we often show so people can see how low the lake is. The lake is chock full, right? And I managed not to fall over and get sucked through the intakes. But my mom was always seen as something of a soothsayer in our family, a little bit of a visionary in a weird kind of a way. There were all these odd coincidences that would happen in our family surrounding my mom. And I think, you know, in retrospect, I think my mom was seeing that that lake and I were going to go to battle somehow, right? But what yep. she didn't know was that lake wasn't going to take me. That lake was going to make me. Everything that we've accomplished here, a lot of it was driven by the challenges that we faced. And this whole community, this organization, this community stepped up every single time. We would pick a goal and we'd think, man, that is so far out of reach. And then we would achieve it and exceed it and set another goal. And this community just kept stepping up. And we've made so much extraordinary progress. We started at 211 gallons per capita per day. If you're a 20-year resident here, think back. Every single residential street had a brook running down it from like seven to nine in the evening and seven to nine in the morning. Oh yeah. We just had these rivers of water running down the street. It was a totally different environment. We were literally most often mocked for our excess. And we have built something to be proud of. Everybody who's here every day is making a difference. It's been extraordinary fun for me. It's a little bit like getting to play in a Super Bowl. Go Bengals. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. Who day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is not of my doing. It's the doing of the many people that we get to engage with every day that have embraced this philosophy of treating water with much more respect than we used to. Well, Doug, on behalf of the Southern Nevada Water Authority and all of those that have worked with you, I know you are going to be sorely missed. You obviously have cultivated a fantastic team that is prepared to step up and fill that void and keep our conservation progress moving forward. It really was a lot of your efforts that built that program that got the rubber to meet the road and drive down water use. Just like you said, 211 gallons per capita per day. We're obviously well below that now. We're going to talk a little bit about GPCD. But again, Doug, hats off to you and we wish you the best success on your future endeavors. And Hey, wherever you end up landing, and hopefully you stick around in Southern Nevada and live out your retirement years, but if you move on to another community to help them become even more water efficient, I think we can all agree that that community will have just hit triple sevens across that slot machine for a solid jackpot. Yeah, and the Water Smarts podcast can call me anytime, Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate that, Doug, keeping that expertise available to us. Now, we're going to hear a little bit more from Doug as we move forward. But, JC, I want to shift to you for just a minute. We've just heard a little bit of Doug's background and some of the story and in his involvement in building this world-class conservation program that we have all come to live by. But before we talk about what the next measures are that SNWA is rolling out this year, JC, can you just remind everyone why we are introducing these new and some might say rather aggressive, I prefer to say progressive conservation actions this year? 
Well, yeah, I'm happy to do that. But before I do, if I can take a second, I can't let Doug get away with being that modest. I have had the privilege of working with him for almost a quarter of a century. I'm proud to call him a friend and a colleague. And Doug and I have very different personalities. And he is known for his passion and his dedication to what he does. And that is why he is internationally renowned as a thought leader in the world of conservation. So be as modest as you want, Doug. But the reality is, yes, it took a lot of people to implement, to go along, to, to do all of the things that represent the achievements to date. But somebody had to lay out the vision and somebody had to be relentless in the pursuit of being more water efficient. I have called you many times an evangelist, and I meant that in the most complimentary way. Just as I can't match Bronson's energy when he's speaking, I can't match your passion for what you do. It comes through in everything that you try to achieve. And so good on you. And Bronson's right. Somebody hit the triple sevens because they are going to get arguably the most knowledgeable, passionate conservation professional in the United States and maybe one in the world. So enough of that. To your question, Bronson, yes, we have been accused of being very aggressive, and I'm not sure I'm going to disagree with that, but necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, we are two decades plus into the most severe drought in the recorded history of the Colorado River. We have watched our reservoir, our lifeblood, go from about 95% full when this started to about 27% full the last time I checked. And it's only going to get worse. And the problem is the decline accelerates because Lake Mead is actually not shaped like a bowl, it's shaped like a V. And so like that martini glass, those last sips go in a hurry. And so it is incumbent that we do everything we can as a community to protect ourselves. We got the smallest share of Colorado River by a lot when the lake was divvied up you know, a century ago. And there is nothing that's going to change that. Somebody would have to give up their water in order for us to get more. So the Calvary isn't coming. Whatever we do as a community to survive and thrive in this situation is, is going to be entirely in our hands. The Water Authority has been very proactive, and it was actually controversial at the time when they built a new low lake level intake and pumping station because it was more than a billion dollars. But if we hadn't burrowed underneath Lake Mead and popped up from the bottom like a drain plug, we would be having a very different conversation today. But as it is, because we capture and recover all of our indoor water, we're a perpetual motion machine for our critical needs. And so when you look at the measures that we're taking while they are aggressive, are common sense, and they're not anything that ruins somebody's quality of life. Although dog walkers might try to tell me that they're fluffy, can only go to the bathroom on grass, I can tell you unequivocally that that isn't true. There's not going to be a defecation strike if dogs don't have grass. It's not going to happen. And, and you, you've tested that with your own. I have tested. Not. I have the world's most pampered dog, courtesy of my wife. And as it turns out, when nature calls, he answers. And it doesn't really matter where it is. And, you know, we're having conversations with the commercial development and resort community communities and the warehouse communities. If you drive up on the 15 north of town, you'll see horizon to horizon warehouses. Well, those used to be evaporatively cool. Now we're moving away from that because we can't afford to use our water supply as nothing more than a heat sink. So given the fact that in this calendar year, we're going to have 8 billion gallons less water to work with than we did a couple of years ago, we can't afford to leave any stone unturned in terms of trying to reduce our, our water. It's part of a larger uh, strategy of getting us down to 86 gallons per capita per day. And that represents eh, somewhere between a 17 and 20 percent reduction over where we are right now. So we've got some work to do, but we're on the right path. 
And that 8 billion gallons less that we have this year to work with is because of shortage conditions on the Colorado River, federal mandates that reduce the amount of water that Nevada and Arizona can take. California has some future shortages as Lake Mead hits lower trigger elevations, but that's the reason that our water supply was reduced by about 7 billion gallons last year. It's going to be 8 billion gallons this year, further reinforcing the need for us to continue to manage our water demands through these aggressive and progressive conservation measures. Yeah, JC's absolutely right. And what's really exciting is looking at where we've come. So we talked about the 211 GPCD, right? And GPCD, what's good about that is it's a nice metric to be able to measure our performance. And what we're truly measuring is how much water SNWA and, and the Southern Nevada community requires to be depleted from our water resources on a per person per day basis. So we started at 211 and we're looking like we're 104 last year. We've cut by more than half the demands on a per capita basis. And one of the things that JC pointed out, the key to all of this, everybody gets excited about rebate programs. Don't get me wrong. Get this product, get a rebate. Do this thing, get a rebate. It's exciting. It's fun. Everybody can engage with it. The reality is what has taken us this far is policy. So back in the early 2000s, we talked about streams running down the street. We had so many non-functional front yards. They would water, water would run off, it would run down the street. And we were building at that time, sometimes in the realm of 20 to 35,000 new homes every single year. And 80 to 100,000 people were moving to Las Vegas. It was a big push on our demands. But the policies that we implemented said, we're going to start building some of the most efficient development that we can. And that was the first step when we said, we can build houses. We don't need to put grass in the front yard. We can do something different. We can put less grass in the backyard. We don't need grass in front of a 7-Eleven. And why is grass so important in this discussion? Because we found through research that grass in the Mojave Desert was getting 10 feet of precipitation applied through sprinklers. 10 feet. My friends, that is Amazon rainforest levels of precipitation to keep some grass alive that people were only walking on when they were pushing a lawnmower. And so by making simple changes about what our ethic was, what our design aesthetic was, how we were going to live, we could still have great looking desert adapted yards. And we were only going to apply about a foot and a half of water to them, 17 gallons versus 73 gallons. So the push on turf limitations, let's keep the grass where we need it. Let's put something else green and attractive and that contributes to our urban environment where we don't need grass. Let's keep our parks, our soccer fields, our functional turf, and let's start changing the other. Back in the old days, Bronson, we had the Water Smart Landscapes program. It was running in the early 2000s and we did not yet have a policy. And I did an analysis and I found out that for every person we recruited into the Water Smart Landscape program, 28 houses were built with a little postage stamp of grass in front of them. We were going backwards. We were chasing our own tail and we weren't even doing a good job of that. And so the policies that we put in place were really critical. And that's why I say that what we've accomplished has been through the will of the whole community, our elected officials, our organizational leadership, people in this community thought those policies made a lot of sense. You know, the one thing that I would add to Doug's comments is that one of the policies we put in that may not have seemed like a big deal at the time was putting in the mandatory watering schedule, right? Because horticulturalists know how often you're supposed to water your landscape, whether it's grass or drip irrigated plants in a particular time of year. But most homeowners are a little afraid of the the clock, right? So the landscapers set it up like seven days a week, half an hour a day when they first moved in and it was a set it and forget it. And people People just didn't really think about it. And I track the water use in the community pretty closely, and we're able to do that by sector. And a lot of the reductions we saw in calendar year 2022 are attributable to a greater compliance with the mandatory watering restrictions. Like we saved hundreds of millions of gallons just by virtue of people watering one day a week in winter, watering three days a week in fall. These things matter a lot, uh, more than people think. Because remember, that landscaping water is, is one of the big chunks of water that we can't get back. So 
a seemingly small thing like just setting your watering clock for the appropriate number of days makes a huge difference when you multiply it times hundreds of thousands of households. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, JC, because when you consider that in 2021, our community used 110 gallons per person per day, and during that same year, our compliance or the number of people that were changing their sprinkler clock to follow the seasonal watering restrictions was somewhere around 50%. Fast forward one year to 2022, our GPCD went from 110 to about 104, and we saw a compliance rate, meaning how many people in the community were following those seasonal watering restrictions of about 70%. So we went from 50 to 70% and we saw a decline in our per capita water use. You're absolutely right. Those uh, seasonal watering restrictions really do pay dividends. Another one was, it's not a law, but we had a very good monsoon season last year, right? We only wound up with a little more than two inches of rainfall last year, but we got it at the time of year when it really made a difference. We got it in July, we got it in August, we got it in September. And what it meant was that a huge number of our customers voluntarily went out and interrupted their controllers. When you have hundreds of thousands of people do it, it's hundreds of millions of gallons of water per event, and that becomes billions of gallons of water. It makes a tremendous difference suspending your irrigation. So I I know we touched on, um, well, Doug and JC touched on a little bit about some of the conservation measures that were put in place kind of in the beginning, you know, like in the early 2000s when we realized that, hey, you know, things are changing and we're starting to see a decline in the lake. What else, in addition to the Water Smart Landscapes rebate and the watering restrictions, what are the conservation measures that we put in place to get us to where we are today? They've been numerous. And I think one of the points that we've made, and I think that this community appreciates, is we've asked every sector to contribute. So we've seen contributions from every sector. For example, limits on fountains. Just as we had streams running down many of our residential and the suburban streets, we also had a propensity in Las Vegas to want to put a fountain in front of everything. Literally a gas station. Come on now. How about a dentist's office, a bank, your HOA? Well, maybe not just a fountain. How about a waterfall? Let's put something amazing out there. It was a little ostentatious for people who lived in an environment where they gets four inches of rainfall every year. And don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of Las Vegas is facade. But we put limits on fountains. We said, this is just not appropriate. There are places that we might be able to have them, but let's limit them. The golf courses. We did analysis and we found that some golf courses were more efficient than others by huge amounts. And yet, when you looked at the performance and reputation of those courses, those using very little water had a very solid reputation in the industry. They attracted many, many golfers, just the same as the golf courses that were using much more significant amounts of water. And so we imposed a golf course water budget. A golf course water budget is basically a pricing strategy that says these people, if they perform under this budget, will get water at this rate. And if they exceed the budget, there'll be a financial penalty assessed. The golf industry absorbed that, performed really well. We went and looked at it again recently and made an additional modification to the golf water budget. And again, it's one that the majority of golf courses in the region say is perfectly doable. We redesign the courses, we take the rebate monies from the water authority, and we can get our water use down and still provide an excellent golfing environment for the sportsmen, sportswomen in our region and the visitors that come visit us. Uh, we've also done a lot over in JC's side, and I think this is what's really exciting. So you mentioned that JC is moving as director of customer care for the Las Vegas Valley Water District. There are a ton of pricing policies Tiered rates are one of those. The excessive use surcharges that were just put in place, but will start to fall into the hands of those customers that are going to get them over the next month or so. That's to get the attention of people that are not doing those things that we've been preaching about for 20 years. So there are still customers out there that are not following the watering schedules, that are still pouring 10 feet of water under grass, that still have leaks that haven't been corrected and are paying very little attention. Well, pricing is one of those ways to get them. So some exciting policies there and the opportunity with new technology to tell people more about their water use. All of our member agencies, the city of Henderson, North Las Vegas, uh, the Las Vegas Valley Water District are implementing what we call smart metering systems. And we're going to be able to tell customers a lot more about their water use, help them identify leaks a lot more quickly, 
those are all exciting. Some of our programs are not policies or, or rebates, but they're partnerships with industry. So we have partnerships with our water smart contractors. The water smart contractors are those that have attended water efficiency training and understand our programs well. We've got water smart car washes. We've got linen exchange programs, water upon request. So again, reaching out into the community and finding partnerships with every water using sector that we can to make a difference. Doug, you make a good point there when you talk about every sector of our community has contributed to our conservation success. Would you just talk briefly, and you gave us a good overview of grass versus water smart landscaping and that we apply so much more water to grass in order to make it grow and thrive in this desert environment as compared to drip irrigated trees and plants. Can you just talk, Doug, about the new rules that have been implemented to help ensure that new development, especially that within the residential sector, is more water efficient than our existing development that already is here in Southern Nevada? Oh, sure, Bronson. We're a fast growing community and I was a newcomer in 2000, right? So I was part of that growth when I came here in 2000. And there are a lot of Las Vegans. Obviously, we have a lot of natives and they're very proud of being native Nevadans. But the vast majority of us are probably newcomers or first or second generation Las Vegans. People come here because of the tremendous opportunities that this community affords them. But we also have an expectation that the next person to move in is going to be doing everything they can to ensure sure that we have a reliable water supply. And that's our expectation too. So now that we're operating under drought measures and we're seeing some reductions to our water supply, we are still providing housing. We're still providing resources, commercial businesses for these new populations coming in. But what we're not doing is putting sprinkler irrigation or turf grass anywhere on those properties. It's important that those of us that have been here for a while know that when you see these new developments going in, they are absolutely the most water efficient housing being built anywhere in the United States. Just to clarify that, Doug, the ordinances and rules that have been in place that have been updated are now prohibiting any grass in any new development. We prohibited it in commercial development back in the mid-2000s. We limited the amount of grass that could be placed in backyards. We prohibited grass in front yards. And now, any new development that happens, residential, commercial, or otherwise, there will be no grass, no spray, irrigation associated with those properties, meaning that the vast majority of their water use will be indoor water use, which again, we reclaim, treat, return back to Lake Mead, and every gallon we return back to Lake Mead means we can take another gallon out and bring it through the drinking water treatment process. So, Doug, did I get that correct then on just kind of that overview? No grass allowed in any new single family developments, right? Including backyards? That's right. But we're we're still going to put turf grass into parks, right? So those neighborhoods will still have community parks. That's a good investment. And the other thing I want to clarify, Bronson, while a larger fraction of the water in these new homes is going to be indoors because we reduce the outdoor component. Even with drip irrigation, even with water efficient plants, outdoor irrigation is still the greatest opportunity to manage your water use. So even if you've done all the right things, made the right selections, complied with all the policies, you still got to watch very closely your outdoor irrigation because misscheduling that irrigation, failing to repair a malfunction in that irrigation can result in using thousands and thousands of gallons of water. So people still need to pay attention. Great point there because drip irrigation is not set it and forget it, right, JC? That's correct. You know, the one thing I wanted to point out, we talked a little earlier about the excessive use surcharge. And if you're getting in that, you are one of the top 10% of heaviest water users in the valley. That was designed so it would be invisible to almost everybody. But this this top 10%, they're going to see the excessive use surcharge. And the fastest way to get out of that excessive use surcharge is by changing your clock to what, what it should be. Believe it or not, it's actually possible, and we have seen it, people using more water with a drip irrigated landscape than their neighbor with the same size in grass because they're overwatering that drip irrigated landscape that much. And then, of course, when you saturate them that much with water, it makes it turn a little yellow and they go, oh, well, the plants don't look healthy. I wonder what I should do. Why don't I add some water? And so they actually make it worse. And so it's important that just because you don't have any grass, it doesn't mean you're done. You have to manage your irrigation. We know that the average household uh, uses about 30 3,800 gallons a month 
indoors. And the standard deviation on that is actually pretty low, meaning that even if you have a bunch of kids and you have teenagers taking long showers, you are going to be hard pressed to use more than 5,000 gallons a month indoors. So if you're seeing a water bill that has you using 12, 15, 20,000 gallons of water a month, you just need to understand that that's all either uh, going into your landscape or a combination of your landscaping and your pool. So your indoor use is really pretty low. So if, if you're being impacted by the excessive use surcharge, look to that irrigation first. And it works great if you're paying attention, but I got to tell a story. So I have a colleague, not one of my conservation colleagues, but a colleague in the water industry did a conversion and then came back to me and he goes, I am not saving as much water as I thought I would. And I go, well, you know, do you see when it irrigates? Are you actually outside? Oh, not really. I go, something's got to be wrong, right? Turn on the timer, run the drip system and walk around the yard. See if you see any leaks or malfunctions. A fitting had completely come apart. So literally his drip system was running like an open hose for, for half an hour at a time. That'll do it though, won't it? That'll, that'll oh, drive yeah. your water use up oh, yeah. right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, he found that, fixed it and, and got the savings that we were looking for. So you can put the right systems in, but malfunctions, problems problems, failure to manage them properly can run up your water use. So just to go back a little bit, we were largely talking about homeowners and residents with the turf and sprinkler systems, but this really applies to businesses too. So in case anybody's out there wondering, like, why just the residents? We have these rules that apply to the business sector as well. JC, can you explain what is being done to ensure businesses, HOAs, multifamily properties like apartment complexes have water efficient landscapes and contribute to reducing that overall GPCD we been talking about. Sure. And in, in fact, uh, as a category, single family residential is the largest, but it only represents about half of the total water use in the valley. The other half is divided between multifamily properties and commercial properties and schools and parks and all these other kind of things. The point of all of the measures is to share the burden, the responsibility for being water efficiently evenly. So we're asking everybody to contribute something to our community's future. So in the case of businesses and HOAs and apartment complexes and in government agencies even, we created AB 356, which is a state law. And it says essentially that at the end of 2026, you can no longer use our water supply to irrigate non-functional grass. And then we convened a committee of citizens for from all of these different sectors to settle on what are going to be the definitions. What is non-functional grass? And kind of shocking in this day and age where it's hard to get people to agree on a lunch order, that they actually reached unanimous agreement on what was non-functional grass. And the, the easiest way I can put it is apply the swing set test. If you wouldn't let your kids or your grandkids play on a swing set on that particular patch of grass, it's probably in the wrong place. It's probably non-functional. So we're talking about business parks, right? Because next to their big fountains, the gas stations also thought that they needed a lawn, as did the dentist office and all of those kind of places. HOAs right at the entrance, right? You turn into it and they want it to look pretty. One of the great ironies, and I've done literally hundreds of HOA presentations over the last couple of years, and some of them they're clutching that grass as hard as they can. But the reality is those developers did not put in grass because they wanted it to look pastoral. They did it because it was the fastest, cheapest thing they could install. But that was then, right? So when you look at an HOA with a big turf entrance or you look at a commercial complex as you're going down Flamingo or Sahara or whatever, and it's got a lot of grass in it, that's a relic. That is something that's dating from the 80s or 90s. And as those of us who are old enough know, there were a lot of bad decisions made in the 80s and 90s, not the least of which was my hairstyle. But that was then and this is now. And we have to deal with the fact that we're in the driest metro area in North America and one of the driest metro areas on the planet. And so we have to live accordingly. And it means that this purely ornamental turf, just turf just for looking at, that's just not a luxury that we can afford. 
Beyond just the turf, Doug alluded to the golf course water budgets. The new golf course water budgets are substantially lower than the previous ones. And in some cases, what we're seeing golf courses do is take out some of those peripheral areas that used to just be in grass and they're converting them like Anthem Country Club, very, very high end golf course. They actually converted their entire course over from a cool season grass, which requires a lot of water to a warm season variety that goes dormant in the winter, which requires like eh, between 25 and 30 percent less water per square foot, depending on how you irrigate it. So they They made a huge improvement in their water efficiency and didn't even have to take out any grass to do it. Another major issue that's come up is evaporative cooling. I talked about the warehouses earlier. They've got these giant swamp coolers like you think about on maybe in your garage, except multiply it times 500 and you get the size. Like a a typical uh, swamp cooler in in an industrial complex, that one swamp cooler uses as much water as a couple of swimming pools every year. And the roof is just dotted with them. There might be a hundred swamp coolers on that roof. You have cooling towers. If you're in a hotel or you're in in a big high-rise building, you just think it's air conditioning. But essentially what they're doing is they're using our water supply as a heat sink to make the system operate more efficiently. And so we are in the process right now of putting a moratorium on evaporative cooling in new construction. And at the same time, we are heavily incentivizing the replacement of existing evaporative systems with their non-evaporative equivalents. And so we are asking every sector to play a role in helping us thrive and survive under the conditions that we're in. The Southern Nevada Water Authority set a goal of reaching 86 gallons per capita per day by the year 2035. And we've covered a lot of ground here about how we're stepping toward that goal, but there's still more to it. Doug, what are some of the other measures that are being implemented to reduce our water consumption? Well, one of the ones that I wanted to expand on was JC talked about how some of the golf courses are moving from cool season to warm season grasses. The vast majority of Southern Nevadans live in a homeowners association. Most of those homeowners associations do have parks. And he also talked about decisions made in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, there was a move in the valley toward cool season grasses. Historically, warm season grasses like Bermuda grass were typically being used in the valley. They started using tall fescue. Tall fescue is that grass that still maintains some of its color over the winter. Now that's a nice characteristic, but is it a characteristic that merits putting 10 feet of water on? There are lots of opportunities for us to do those conversions and the authority has a rebate program to do it. It's one of the simplest things that can be done on a large functional turf area. One that was controversial, Crystal, was the swimming pool size limitation. We're looking kind of at an unintended consequence. We talked early in the podcast about the restrictions on fountains. People like moving water. I like moving water. Moving water is an exciting and cool and stimulating thing. The sound of it, the motion of it, it's a little bit like staring at a campfire or something, right? But there's an appropriate time, place, and scale. And what we found is that when we restricted ornamental fountains, some of the most financially enabled homeowners in the valley found that they could build extraordinary swimming pools because we did not have any policies affecting swimming pools. I just had one of my staff bring to me what I believe is the largest single family swimming pool in the valley. The visible portion of the pool is 13,000 square feet. This is one house with a 13,000 square foot swimming pool and the pool appears to extend beneath the roof area of the home. So it, it appears to be even larger still. Now, just for a little bit of perspective, my entire home lot is about 4,000 square feet. You could put my entire house's lot, three of them, into this person's swimming pool. And so what was happening was they would simply make sure that their water features met the definition of a swimming pool and they could build it as large as they wanted. And that's not appropriate. But we found the average swimming pool in the valley was typically 300 to 500 square feet. And so we put a cap at 600 square feet. 
And there was a little bit of an outcry from the people that feel like they need several thousand square feet of swimming pool. And there was even some misunderstanding of, amongst the general public that we were encroaching on, you know, the traditional Las Vegas lifestyle. But the reality is it really had no impact on the average Southern Nevadan, but it did close a loophole on what we were seeing basically in the water feature arena. So that was another measure that went in recently, and it was certainly one that was appropriate. Lastly, some of our friends out there in the community are going to see these excessive use charges. We have created a course that'll be offered four times a year to try and help people decipher where their water is being used. You can go to snwa.com and sign up for it. It'll be offered two times online. And we'll offer it also two times in person at the Springs Preserve. And the idea is to provide a place where people who aren't sure why they use so much water that we've now gotten their attention to be able to get some expert advice on where they should be looking and what kinds of tasks they need to do to bring their water use under control. Good information there. And if you are a Las Vegas Valley Water District customer, the excessive use charge has been implemented. I want to talk just a little bit more about that because we've mentioned it a couple of times here. So, JC, I want to ask you a little bit. Can you just give our listeners a little bit more of an overview of those excessive use charges and where they can go for more information? Because I know the Las Vegas Valley Water District has a bill estimator on LVVWD.com. And if you sign up for my account, you can actually get seasonal comparisons on what your bill is going to look like. Can you just speak to that a little bit for Las Vegas Valley Water District customers? Sure, I'd be happy to. There's a substantial amount of water that's being used outdoors, right? We know our indoor water is relatively low because we have such huge seasonal swings. The excessive use charge is designed so that you're allowed to use more water without reaching it during the summer than you are during the winter. Because if you're hitting the excessive use charge in winter, you are significantly over irrigating. It's just that simple because it only hits that top 10% of heaviest residential users in the valley. So it changes. It, it rises in spring. It rises more in summer. It drops back down in terms of the threshold that you hit it at in the fall and then drops down again into winter. And so it's designed to mirror what you should be using at your house over the course of a year. And if you're reaching it, the intent of the excessive use charge is not to generate money. It's to get people to get away from that set it and forget it mentality on their irrigation system. It's to get them to be more conscious of how they are using our community's most precious resource. Because again, for most people, they'll never even know that it's a thing. The intent is just to get people to use the resource more responsibly. Now, the one that's going to be a little trickier for people, uh, particularly those in older homes, bigger lots, is that for many years, single family properties with larger meters. So instead of like a standard five eighths inch meter, they've got a three quarter or they've got a one inch meter. A few of them even have like one and a half inch meters, which are giant industrial grade meters. They've been essentially getting a huge volume discount on the water. So they're able to buy more water at tier one than a regular customer, if you if you want to call it the standard house with a five eighths inch meter, can buy in the first three tiers. And so we realized that that was inequitable. The reason that they had been getting that volume discount is because their meter was designed to provide greater flow. And that was just what the builder did when they first built the structure. Okay, so now we've evened the playing field. Everybody gets the same volume of water at each tier. And so for people who have essentially been getting a huge volume discount for many years and are accustomed to just using water without thinking about it, because it's so cheap, they're gonna notice this. And we're hoping that they will take that as a sign, maybe I need to, to decide, do I really need a quarter acre of grass in the front yard where nobody's looking at it? Do I, I really need to water every single day in winter? Those kind of things. And so uh, that's gonna be a little bit of an adjustment adjustment for them. But again, we have a lot of knowledge resources to help people reduce their water use because that is really the object here is to bring down the water use on these incredibly high use properties. 
and, and JC talked about that in, in the context of the Las Vegas Valley Water District, but it's important for your listeners to know that the city of Henderson also implemented a similar policy, and the city of North Las Vegas never had a policy that discounted water for customers with larger meters. So their rate structure is already in alignment with these. We call it tier equalization, but it, it basically means that without regard to how large the pipe is, you're going to pay the same price for water as the vast majority of the people in the Valley are already paying at their homes. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I don't think anybody would agree just because you have a larger water meter, you should be able to use more water at a cheaper rate than somebody who has a smaller water meter. So we've created parity amongst that residential customer base. Doug Bennett, conservation manager, not for too much longer as you head on into retirement. And J.C. Davis, our former enterprise conservation manager and now Las Vegas Valley Water District Director of Customer Care. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us here today on the Water Smarts Podcast. It was a pleasure. Yeah, a lot of fun, Bronson. Thank you. Glad to have you on one more time, Doug. We're going to miss you, man. Salute to you, sir. Well, Crystal, another great conversation there, a lot of good information. I mean, the focus on conservation continues to be of the utmost importance. And I think that this podcast and kind of this subject matter and having Doug and JC on here, it's really going to help the community understand why we've implemented some of the things that we have implemented over the past couple of years. And also a pat on the back to the community for all that they've been doing to help us drive down water use. We can't do this alone. It takes 2.3 million Southern Nevadans to come along with us. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about this a lot the last 20 years, more than 20 years now. Yeah and how much conservation has done for us. And I know we're always going to have some naysayers who don't think conservation's really the answer or it's going to be enough. But I've been reading a book about the Colorado River Compact, and I came across this the other day, and I didn't know this, so I just wanted to share this. In 2000, Southern Nevada was using more than its allotment Correct. from the Colorado River. 325,000 acre feet in 2000. Right? And our allotment's 300,000 acre feet a year. In 2021, we used 242,000 acre feet. And I think our preliminary numbers, if I'm right, Bronson, for 2022 is 224. Right about, yep. Thousand acre feet. So think about that. That's just in 20 years, we have dropped our water use by almost 100,000 acre feet. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you absolutely are, because it, last year, which was 2022, although all of the accounting isn't done, our expectation is, is that we're going to come in at 225,000 acre feet. So that's 100,000 acre foot difference in 20 years, while our community has grown by more than 750,000 people during that same time. Conservation works, right? Yeah. So nobody can tell me that it doesn't, because I will right. argue that. We got a strong economy here. We've got jobs here. We've got a wonderful quality of life. All of that is attributed to the work that our community has done to help ensure that we are one of the most water efficient communities in the nation. We are well on our way. If we're not already there, we're well on our way to being there. And that's it for this episode here on Water Smarts. Please subscribe and join us next time. You can send us some questions if you've got some top of mind. You can reach us via email at watersmarts at snwa.com. That email address again is watersmarts at snwa.com. Shoot us a question. We're happy to respond to it. We might talk about it on our next podcast. And we thank you for listening. And we hope you join us here next time on Water Smarts. Water Smarts.